Thank you. Sorry for the quick switch. We thought this was a more logical um, order of operations doing a mobilization simulation in motion management before we move on to image fusion. Um, I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to participate today. Um, we do have a few disclosures. Henry Ford Health System holds research agreements both with uh, Varian Medical Systems and Philips Healthcare. So the objectives for this talk are to talk about some of the immobilization devices used for SRS and extracranial SBRT, to describe CT simulation processes, to describe motion management for SBRT, and then to introduce an uh, emerging technologies relevant to the radio surgery and SBRT treatments. Um, I do have some SAMS questions. They'll come at the end of the talk. And if you see Rory, the Detroit Lions mascot, make sure you pay attention because you'll be asked a question whenever you see him. So pay attention to that slide. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit then about the cranial immobilization simulation, then the extracranial, looking at immobilization motion management there, and then the emerging technology. So this is the outline of the talk. So the gold standard for radio surgery um, immobilization was always the SRS head frames. Um, so these are, there's many platforms that are available. Let's see, there we go. Um, we, we have the Electa Fraction, the Varian uh, Radionics CRW and BRW frame interface, the Lexo Gamma Knife we've heard a lot about, and then the Brain Lab Stereo Tactic frame interface. Um, so the frame then is going to define the coordinate system and positions the target site at the isocenter for radiation fields. Um, and so it, it consists of a head frame with these um, posts that are actually drilled into the patient's skull. You can see there's four here. And then it, it aligns to the couch. And then we can use, um, in this case, our edge machine to do the six degree of freedom couch correction. And so when we compare data from the SRS head frames to those um, with a non-invasive mask, um, what you can see here if we look at the, the light purple is the non-invasive masks and the dark purple is the actual head frame, the SRS head frame, we can see that the intrafraction shifts um, and the uncertainties are actually less when we use the head frame. So it would seem logical in a radio surgery setting, why wouldn't we go ahead and use the head frame and why would we try to use the SRS mask um, instead? But there's actually some disadvantages of using frame-based treatment. So it's invasive and it requires pre-medication and there could be potential infection risks um, at the surgical placement. Uh, it's certainly a clinical resource burden because it requires dedicated physicians and nursing. Uh, it requires planning to be completed following the frame placement on the day of treatment. So it's definitely prohibitive for fractionated SRT. Um, and then another thing that comes up once in a while is the displacement of the head frame after simulation that can cause a translation of the target isocenter and can compromise treatment accuracy um, in the stereotactic space. Uh, here's an example from the literature uh, talking about this phenomenon. So here they have um, a detection of frame slippage based on image guidance at the treatment setup. And so they found almost a five millimeter vertical shift based on um, the SRS localizing uh, positioning system. And so by re-imaging the patient with CT, they actually relocalized it and they found that this was a true slipping of the head and neck uh, frame. So there's been an interest because of those disadvantages into moving into frameless radio surgery, and that's essentially meaning we're using a lot of image guidance. But there's some concern about reducing the uncertainty for this frameless radio surgery. And so that's where we get into the options of intrafraction and intra-treatment imaging. So my colleague James Gordon just talked a little bit about some of the real-time imaging that we do at um, Henry Ford. Also, robotic couches and 60 couch corrections are available on many platforms. And then finally, rigid patient immobilization devices. 
So this is what uh, frameless radio surgery localization in optical tracking systems can look like. Um, you typically have a mask fixation, and then we use our image guidance systems. Um, we can use exact track for intrafraction snapshots, cone beam CT, many platforms are available, MV, KV imaging. Um, and then we also use a positioning array and infrared camera system to initial set up the patient. So you can see these infrared reflective markers are shown here and also on the patient uh, system here to uh, accurately control the couch position through this camera system for the infrared camera tracking and then also the reflective markers on the patient's surface. Um, here's another example of another fixation device using bite blocks and also the infrared macking, uh, tracking devices. Um, so in this case, the dental tray is put in at time of simulation, often a vSIM or something after to verify the setup, and then that's used for patient immobilization. Uh, this is an example of a system that we use at Henry Ford. It's called the Encompass uh, Mask System. So it has a hole that allows us to use our OSMS tracking for intrafraction motion monitoring. Um, it also has some integrated shims to allow us to um, manage any kind of changes in the flexion of the overall mask and fit uh, at time of treatment. Also has some reinforcing um, sections to give some additional stability and support. And so it's important to keep in mind um, as you're working in your program is to think about um, how the setup errors are for your particular immobilization choice. So there's a variety of literature out there. This is just a couple examples. Um, Eric Trigestad found um, a, in a series of four different mask systems, he reported setup errors on the order of two to three millimeters. Uh, Brain Lab mask was found to be on the order of two millimeters. And when you combine the Brain Lab mask and a bite block system, could reduce the uncertainty in uh, half a millimeter. So, you know, it's important to keep in mind that whatever your mobilization you're using is to evaluate what is the uncertainty of that particular mobilization combination that you're using for your practice. Um, here's an example of how you can uh, take some uh, data to determine the intrafraction errors. So these are during treatment, and this is the uncertainty due to the mobilization device or slight patient motions. Um, so this is uh, over the course of 43 patients, 79 fractions of data, where they took pre and post treatment x-rays using exact track, and they found that the intrafraction motion with this particular frameless mask uh, was on the order of 0.4 millimeters on average, but there was a max of about one millimeter. So if we think back to our um, Task group 42, describing some of our initial uncertainties in radio surgery. Keep in mind, this is published back in 1995. Um, we see that the achievable uncertainties in radio surgery um, are largely dominated in this particular table by the CT image resol resolution. So we can see that the CT slice, slice thickness for the column on the left was one millimeter and the column on the right was three millimeter. And so with all other things being equal, you can see it can actually make a large influence on your achievable uncertainties in radio surgery planning. Um, keep in mind there's, you know, quite a lot of time has passed since this initial update, um, initial task group, but it's still a large, largely a lot of the uncertainties are similar. Uh, so here's Rory R. Lyon, whoever's awake. Um, so uh, let's look into our CT simulation considerations. So we know from task group 66 on the CT simulation process that the thinner the CT slice thickness, the higher resolution that we can delineate our structures and the higher quality DRRs that we can generate and the better spatial resolution of those DRRs. Um, of course, one of the drawbacks is you increase the contouring burden, um, which can sometimes make your physicians not happy, but remind them that it's for better certainty. Um, so in our practices at Henry Ford for our SRS brain protocol on our CT scanners, we have a one to 1.5 millimeter slice thickness, depending on which satellite you're at. And then our SRS spine protocol is two millimeters slice thickness. And that's contrasted by our standard external beam, which is three millimeter slice thickness. Okay, so I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit now about our mobilization and motion management for spine, lung, and abdomen. Um, and keeping in mind that uh, Martha Matuzak did a really nice job talking a lot about liver earlier, and also she highlighted a lot of the aspects of TG76 for motion management. So I'll try to pick up on some of the things she maybe didn't discuss. 
Um, so these are our immobilization devices that we use at Henry Ford for our extracranial sites. We use this also for so our SRS spine, our SBRT lung, and SBRT whatever we SBRT these days. There's lots of options that we do some adrenals, some pancreas, um, a lot of different abdominal sites. So we use um, primarily the full body Electa blue bag. So it has this um, plastic sheet and a vacuum type device that allows us to s literally suck all the air out and to immobilize the patient and to reduce the intrafraction uh, motion for um, the tumor motion. And then um, another option is a full body alpha cradle. So sometimes uh, we have a finite amount of these blue bags available. So sometimes we will use a full body alpha cradle as an alternate. Um, and so uh, one thing we want to highlight is that the reproducibility of the patient setup is critical for SRS and SBRT, particularly when you look at uh, fractionated treatments, so up to four fractions for a lot of our lung cases. So we spend a lot of time in simulation getting things right and making sure the patient is going to be able to withstand uh, multiple fractions and also long treatment times. So we put a lot of effort into getting it right at time of simulation using um, arm positioning, head support, and uh, very well demarcated cradle markings. So that way we can try to really improve the setup for future fractions. Um, another uh, option for immobilizing is uh, this body prolog system. Um, and it actually has um, compression paddles that you can use for minimizing abdominal motion. So a lot of our current trials in lung SBRT in particular require some sort of uh, uh, motion management. So a compression paddle or the body fix system with a plastic sheet can also work for those um, trials. So here's an example of the differences between that body fix site and the, the location and then the abdominal compression plate. Um, and what you can see is overall the reduction in tumor motion that you're seeing between the two systems is um, particularly close. Uh, you see some small differences with the abdominal compression plate in um, the soup inf direction, but none of these differences were sig statistically significant. Um, and one thing to keep in mind when you're using a compression plate is that um, all these devices are indexed, and so there's a set value that you're going to set at time of simulation, and you're going to repeat that at time of treatment as well. Um, I know some clinics will also uh, put markings on where that plate was, so that way for future fractions you're setting it up reproducibly. Um, so this is some work out of... Um, from Seppenwald, it's kind of a, a really popular paper. It was outlined in uh, task group 76 on motion management. Um, and this kind of really highlights why uh, motion is a particularly patient-specific problem, um, but it's also location-specific. So this is um, data taken from orthogonal trajectories for 21 different tumors. And so um, you can see when they circle the tumor location, so for instance this 17 or this 9, that means that those tumors were attached to bony structures. Um, but what this case, this, this picture highlights is that there's really a lot of variability and it's very patient dependent. So you can see if this is your scale on one, the order of one centimeters, you can see that a lot of those patients will have tumors that are moving larger than one centimeters. Keep in mind when you see a trajectory that looks um, like it's two-dimensional and not just one-dimensional means that there's some hysteresis with breathing as well. So it just highlights that patients, uh, it's a very patient-specific solution are needed so that way we can address this on a patient-specific basis. And then really the take-home message in TG76 is that we really need to manage patient-specific motion for tumor excursion greater than five millimeters in any direction. And so while it's pre predominantly in the superior inferior, it really can be in any direction. Um, and so here you see our friend Rory again shows up. Um, but we can see that for liver, for instance, these are on a CINE MRI series of about 30 different patients. Um, we can see that for this, uh, in this particular patient during free breathing using CINE MRI, that in all dimensions, the cranial caudal, the anterior posterior, and the medial lateral, all of these dimensions um, were exceeded the five millimeter motion management requirement set forth through TG76. So that means that in all dimensions here, we need to consider how we're going to manage that motion for these cases. 
So some of the consequences of our motion, I think, is best shown in this picture. So we get uh, quite a lot of blurring of the tumor, quite a lot of, uh, it could be blurring in your dose distribution. It could actually lead to marginal misses um, if something's moving too fast and you didn't catch it. Um, and so we can revisit some of the recommendations set forth in ICRU 62, um, where here we're talking about the ITV or what's now called the IGTV in a lot of our NRG studies, and that's the internal target volume. Um, that's shown here in this white in this picture. So that's equivalent to the CTV plus an internal margin to account for target motion. Um, but on, in addition, we have to consider our planning target volume to include a setup margin to account for patient positioning uncertainties over treatment. And those are going to depend on, largely on your mobilization devices um, and also your IGRT uh, criteria. So how do we get our internal target volume? So we saw earlier uh, Dr. Matuzak gave a lot of discussion on the use of 40 CT. We can use the maximum intensity projection and the phase images. You can use end inhale or end exhale CT scanning. Um, that's in the absence of 40 CT, but keep in mind that it does exaggerate. It tends to exaggerate your breathing both at inhale and exhale. Um, before we had 40 CT, so back in the uh, early 2000s, people were actually using a lot of fluoroscopy, using in a conventional simulator or on a fluoro unit, and you can see the, the lung uh, lesion motion and that's how they would estimate what the motion was. Um, Cine MRI, I just showed you that example from, uh, for liver. It's very helpful in abdominal sites. So we use 40CT um, primarily to reduce artifacts due to respiratory motion and to measure and evaluate tumor motion and position during free breathing conditions. And then we can use that data to develop patient-specific tumor margins or the ITV. And so here's an example of a free breathing CT on the left and the corresponding 40 CT for the same patient on the right. And so you can see that the tumor is moving uh, superior and inferior as you might expect. Um, this is kind of an early stage smaller lesion. But the one thing to keep in mind is that, and this is something we heard earlier from Martha, but she mentioned that if we end up planning on the free breathing CT, what is the potential consequences of that? Um, so you can see when you have tumor moving, and if we had planned over here on the free breathing CT, we actually are at a snapshot of time in that patient's breathing cycle, and that tumor is at only one location when really it's moving on the order of a centimeter in this case. And so really the, the biggest complication we can cause when we're giving SBRT lung treatment is truly a geometric miss. So to get a 40 CT, we need to measure the tumor and organ position as a function of time and CT projection, and that's typically derived from an external breathing signal. So this is an example of a waveform uh, that you can get from your 40 CT scanner. On the top is our inhale peaks, on the bottom of our end exhale, and so we get the projection number over time, and then we bend that according to, typically it's binned according to time phases, or it also could be an amplitude binning. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can look at respiratory external tracking. Uh, some of the most common ones are the variant RPM system with the infrared camera uh, projecting on the patient's surface. Um, there's this lap laser ranger finder, it's a little less common. There is a gate CT device, which is the vision RT system um, that's uh, able to be coupled with the CT scanner. There's been some research on using spirometry or the ABC device, and then also the strain gauge or belt, um, which is also um, a bellows type device. So the one thing to keep in mind is that uh, 40 CT is not a perfect solution. You actually can get uh, sorting artifacts. Often it's due to the um, the waveform for the patient breathing. Uh, we've had a couple of cases over the years of the patient having sleep apnea and actually falling asleep during the time of the 40 CT, and that's probably a physicist's worst nightmare because you don't have any waveforms. You essentially get a flat line because that patient stopped breathing. So um, it probably is one of the worst things that can happen. Um, and so it can cause discrepancies in the target and organ delineation, so that can really change your ITV. 
and also can impact the dose calculation accuracy. So I think the work back um, in 2005 by Rietzel really showed this well, how you can end up having a lot of missing data or misrepresented data with um, improperly 40, reconstructed 40 CTs. So just to uh, tell you a little more, the free breathing CT is fast. And so that means it, you know, the couch pitch is, is very fast. It can catch the tumor at an arbitrary and sometimes extreme state of the breathing cycle. Uh, 40CT, on the other hand, is a very slow pitch. And so we have a lot of redundant information and a lot of temporal information for the tumor and organ motion. And so it can sample data over 10 to 20 breathing cycles in a single 40CT. And so many institutions will then use an average CT derived from the 40 CT data for dose, dose calculation and for tumor localization or IGRT. And it's thought that this represents the average or mean breathing state over the 40 CT. Um, another popular approach instead of the average CT is to use a mid-ventilation image. It's very common actually in Europe. Um, and the way they do that is they calculate um, the centroid of the lesion over all the different phases and then they determine a mean position and then they select the phase that corresponds to that mean position of the tumor. So the 4DCT though can uh, include hundreds, sometimes a thousand slices depending on how many phases you're reconstructing. And so to try to uh, minimize the uh, amount of information and, and try to condense all of the data, um, we do what's called a maximum intensity projection or a MIP. And so it's essentially the highest intensity voxel value um, in the 40 CT data set. And a uh, MIP is the same thing except for it's the minimum intensity projection. And that's very helpful in the liver. The MIP is very helpful when you have the um, uh, lung tumor in the background of the lung. Um, and then the average, again, can be derived as an average intensity value, and that's often used in dose calculation and registration. Um, so this is what this would look like if we were to um, consider this as these individual rays through the patient. If we were going to consider the maximum intensity projection, it goes through and it finds all the voxel elements that are the maximum in the entire data set to generate the MIP data set. The MINIP, again, is the, the minimum, and the average is, is the mean. And here we see Rory here on the bottom corner. Um, so this is something to talk about here is that the free breathing CT as shown in this example, um, the lesion and the, the densest portions of it are actually um, quite different than what can be seen in the average CT. And of course the MIP shows the lesion over time and the and ITV was drawn in red here based on the MIP. So the physician will also use the MIP for drawing, but also look at all of the different uh, phases and play the, the movie loop of the 4D images to ensure that all of the tumor volume is being covered by the MIP. But if we take a subtraction image of the average CT and the free breathing CT for that case, we can see there's actually quite a bit of difference in the position on the order of three millimeters for this particular case, particularly in the soup inf direction. So had we been aligning and calculating dose and doing our cone beam alignment to the free breathing CT, we could have actually put in a systematic displacement of that tumor. So some of the commonly used external surrogates for 40 CT sorting um, are the real-time position management system, which is the variant RPM shown on the left. And on the right is the Philips uh, pneumatic bellow system. So the Philips system um, is kind of a plug and play device. Uh, you just plug it into the back of the scanner and it derives um, a pneumatic difference based on being placed on the abdomen and it responds to pressure. Um, the variant RPM device requires uh, the camera and it, it tracks a infrared reflective block. And so we conducted a study um, to look at, see how similar these two were and how um, if there were any differences in a prospective trial of 10 different patients. And so um, what we did was we took the bellows and the RPM device and we acquired one set of 40 CT data and then we retrospectively uh, sorted it offline according to the two, two different surrogates. And what you can see here is there's really no major differences between the RPM shown in red and the bellows device shown in blue. 
If we look at the reconstructions for this patient, um, the MIPS, uh, the RPMs on the left and the bellows is on the right. And you can see there's really no difference in the reconstruction of the lesion or in the target volumes for the lesions. Um, here's another case. This patient had um, some cardiac signal that was picked up by the RPM. And you can see that um, even the, the overall patterns are similar between the two, although we did have some cardiac um, that did show up on the RPM. But again, there's no difference in the overall reconstruction and the maximum intensity projection for that patient. So we found that overall there's comparable results between the bellows and the RPM. The breathing patterns were strongly correlated, and there were no significant differences in the target volumes or the centroids. Um, so overall, there's, there's really no big differences except for the uh, variant RPM can be used also for uh, treatment if you were going to do some gated deliveries. So there's some advantages there. Um, the one advantage of the bellow system is it's, it's very plug and play. It doesn't require an extra computer or anything um, extra except for just putting it into the back of the scanner and, and putting it on the patient. Um, so a, another question that comes up quite a bit is um, how many 40 CTs do we need? Um, the good news is someone's already looked at that. So this is um, some work that came out of Thomas Jefferson where they evaluated a number of different patients and looked at the ratio of the target volumes using um, the ITV generated from 10 different 40 CT phases as the gold standard. Um, and so a couple of things um, that come out of this study one is that as the tumor motion increases, you see some increased variability in the um, ratio of the ITV. So a perfect ITV uh, value with respect to ITV 10 is 100%. So these would be well matched. Um, but when you look at the two-phase acquisitions or the two-phase ITVs, we have a gross underestimation um, on the order of 12% on average of the target volume. Um, and so the recommendation from this work was that you need f four, preferably six or more phases. Four phases um, got you about 95% of the target volume. So more than four phases was um, considered adequate for treatment planning and de determining the ITV. Um, so our practice for 40 simulation for lung SBRT in particular is to use the Electa blue bag system. Uh, first, we take a free breathing CT, and then we do a 40 CT simulation using four phases. The reason we do the free breathing CT is because the physician will come in and mark that scan, and they will not wait for the have to wait for the 40 CT simulation uh, to reconstruct. The 40 CT data reconstruction can take some time. Um, if it's a medial lesion, we'll use IV contrast during the 40 portion of the scan. Again, the physician will mark the isocenter and they're present at time of simulation on the free breathing CT. We will calculate um, dose on the average CT, and then we'll also include a, a PET scan, especially in the medial lesions for delineation. Okay, and then I'm gonna talk now uh, for a minute about um, emerging technologies for simulation. Um, so this is a, a case study. It's a parotid metastases to the brain. And our radiosurgery physician, Dr. Siddiqui, uh, contacted me and said, oh, I, I'd really like to have an MR simulation on this patient. Um, and so what you can see here is this was the diagnostic MRI scan. Um, this looks like a reformat in the coronal plane. Um, this is a diagnostic MR, and he attempted to draw his uh, target volume in this particular case. In the CT sim, not surprisingly, we can't see that lesion at all. And so he asked me if we can do an MR simulation on it so that we can better figure out where the tumor is. Um, again, this is a six millimeter metastatic lesion. And so um, when we did the MR sim, having the information from the physician on what the intent is, uh, we were able to more accurately localize the lesion location. Um, and so it really helps to have access to um, the MR simulator so that way we can know exactly wh what the physician's intent is at the time of the imaging, and then we can make sure that we can provide images that are gonna help them determine what their gross tumor volume may be. Um, and this becomes increasingly important in the era of SRS and SBRT, where the treatments look like this. I probably don't need to tell this to the people in the room, but you know we're looking at using conformal arcs, carving and sculpting dose away from uh, critical organs, and using a single fraction 
18 gray dose uh, with four dynamic arcs. So in the era of SRS and SBRT, figuring out what the GTV is, um, is of increasing importance. So this is our MR simulator. It's a one Tesla Philips scanner. Um, it's housed at our satellite facility at West Bloomfield. Um, so it has a bridged laser system for patient positioning and alignment. So this is a lap laser system. Uh, one of the features of the one Tesla system is that we have rigid body coils um, that we have to fit around our mobilization devices. We have a flat couch top that we will put on so that way we can index all of the mobilization devices. And then we do have dedicated software and imaging protocols that we use for QA. Um, this slide came from James Balter, thanks James. Um, but he's done a lot of work looking at um, MR compatible mobilization devices and coils. And these are you know, things that we need to consider when we are moving into the era of MR using our existing technologies um, and our mobilization devices. So when we started up our MR SIM program, we put a lot of energy into determining which, uh, which mobilization devices were compatible with the MR simulator, and then we also have to find some that are compatible with the coil configurations that we have. Um, and at the end of the day, this is kind of what it comes down to. This is a patient on the left, this is the CT. We can't really see any of the lesion at all, um, but when we have a T2 MR image, this is you know, what the benefits of having the MR data, but as we saw earlier in the talks out of U of M, Mary Fing and Martha Matuzak, it's very important to get this data in the, um, in the states and the breathing phases that we are needed for treatment planning. Um, so this is some ongoing work we have at our institution where we're starting to look at 40 MRI as a correlate to 40 CT. Uh, this is a prospective T2 weighted uh, 2D multi-slice acquisition sequence that we've evaluated, um, looking at kind of overall utility in um, liver and also looking at uh, applicability in, in the amount of time it takes and how practical it would be to move this into the, the clinic. And so we do all this on clinical trial right now. It's not um, FDA approved at this moment, um, but what you can see here in this patient, um, even with a, a pneumothorax on the one side and we're treating um, his liver um, with SBRT on the other side. We have good image quality. We acquire data in seven minutes. And then the overall tagging, if you look at each of these um, different tags, it corresponds to a single slice. We see that overall the tagging was um, acceptable. And then also important is we can see if this yellow line is this at the same location, we can see the excursion over time. So it's very important to try to find surrogates to the CT process back in the MRI simulator. Um, so this is just a, an example of what that actually looks like. So it is very similar to a 40 CT um, in the sense that it's acquired over time. Um, it is prospectively triggered as opposed to retrospectively sorted. And so uh, correlates to 40 CT and comparisons are ongoing at our institution. Um, so another service that's becoming, um, it, keeping us very busy actually, is the radio surgery service here at Henry Ford. Um, so oftentimes we get diagnostic MRIs where the patients obviously are not in treatment position. They have no immobilization devices. Um, in addition, they're often taken with five to six millimeter slice thicknesses, often with gaps. And so um, what we're finding is that we end up having a lot of deviation, particularly near the spinal cord. This, in this case, we're treating this T6 lesion, and this is the um, CT contours and MR contours from MR SIM overlaid onto the diagnostic uh, MR. And so what you can see here is that there's clearly, because of the lack of immobilization devices, we can't um, see that the, we can see that the uh, alignment in the spine is not the same. Um, but when we have our MR SIM and we have all of the blue bag for immobilization, we also are paying special attention to the slice thickness and no gaps, we get a much better image registration. So um, I just want to give a plug out and shout out to um, everyone. We have a fourth annual MR and RT symposium that's going to be held this summer in Ann Arbor. Um, it'll include courses, panels, symposia. Uh, scientific presentations and vendor exhibits. So if you are interested in incorporating uh, MR and MR SIM more heavily into your radiosurgery practices, uh, please keep it in mind. Okay, so we've made it to our SAMS questions. Everyone can get out their clickers. Are you ready? Okay. 
Okay, so what is an advantage of using thinner CT slice thickness for cranial radiosurgery planning? One, lower imaging dose. Two, higher resolution DRRs. Three, faster scan time. Four, higher in-plane resolution. Or five, less accurate delineation. Okay, and everyone, most of us got it right, the higher resolution DRRs. And as we saw from TG66, DRR quality depends on CT slice thickness, smaller slice thickness, gives us more accurate treatment volumes and critical structures, um, in particular when you're looking out of plane versus in plane. Okay, the next Sam's question. Which 4D CT image set is most appropriate to use for cone beam CT based IGRT and dose calculation? One is end exhale, two is maximum intensity projection, three is the average CT, four is end inhale, and five is free breathing CT. Okay. And the answer is the average CT. So it best represents the mean patient density and it can impact the dose calculation and the image guidance. And remember, we had that systematic offset if we had used the free breathing CT compared to the average. So this is an important take home message. Okay, and which technique is most appropriate for assessment of liver cancer motion? One is 40 CT, two is axial CINE MR, Three is coronal plane CINE MR, four is 40 MR, and five is fluoroscopy. Okay. What we saw here is um, the answer is 40 MRI. Um, the reason for that is because a single plane, we saw that the motion management threshold is five millimeters, and we saw that every plane actually had motion. And so we would need at least two of the different views or 40 MR, so that way we can better characterize the tumor motion for liver. And that's it. I'm going to hand it over to Christy Brock, who is now going to talk more about uh, image fusion and image registration.